OK, thank you. Um, so I don't know how long I've got left. Kind of, What's 50 minutes? We're going to eat into that. I'm just going to talk over you eating, so carry on. Um, if you want to stop and ask questions, feel free. There is a mic that we can get if there's any questions. I'm going to talk about um, stateless desktops, uh, explain what stateless is, what we mean by it, uh, and a particular architecture. I'm going to go into a, a customer of mine that adopted this uh, architecture as well. We'll talk about some of the design considerations of view, particular stateless desktop view, and some of the operational considerations. So, I talked about what the agenda is, um, what a stateless desktop is. We'll talk about 5.1, what's new in that, and how does that fit in with this architecture, or does it? Does it solve some of the problems? Um, how we design it, customer use case, other things we need to think about, and operational considerations. So before we dive into that, you know, why stateless? You know, why am I even up here talking about this stateless model? And anyone who's looked at a reference architecture will know what that is. And what we've seen is there's some common storage issues people run into when they try and do view, uh, when they try and proof a concept, when they try and pilot, when they try and scale out. Uh, and often the standard approach to storage isn't good enough for VDI. You know, we run into this problem of IOPS. Some cases we run into a space issue. So how do I do that? Um, sometimes it's down to lack of testing. Sometimes it's down to lack of understanding of this. So what we've come up with is an architecture here to use a stateless desktop stateless from the user perspective, um, and use some local storage inside the servers. Right? This is one solution. This is not the only solution. This isn't a one, one size fits all. Uh, and in my customer that I'm going to talk about, um, they've used this for probably 90% <laughs> of the use cases. The other 10% are kind of very, dem other different use cases that are slightly more demanding. Um, so in those use cases, that 10%, we've actually put them on shared storage. So it's a mix and match and see what's best. Uh, you may use some problem acceleration software. So what is a stateless desktop? Essentially it is to us a floating desktop, right? The desktop doesn't belong to an end user. They lease it. They go into a pool. They want a desktop. We give them one out of the pool. They use it. When they're finished, they log out and it goes back into the pool, right? So they don't own that desktop. We do have a model where they have ownership, a persistent desktop. In a floating desktop, there's no ownership there. They lease the desktop. Um, we're using tiering as well. So we're putting different components of the virtual machine onto different tiers of storage. And in this particular architecture, we're actually using local storage. So this offers certain price advantages. You know, my SAN is very, very expensive. To put something like SSDs in my SAN is horrendously expensive. So how do I get effective tiering in there? Well, putting SSDs into Local storage into a server actually is more cost effective and offers me some different options here. This is where this architecture came about. So how does a user interact? As I said, they log in through view, they get this desktop, they work away with their apps. End of the day, they log out. So end user, it's very clear how they interact. IT as well, it's a bit different. So they're going to provision a pool of desktops. <laughs> All the desktops in that pool are going to be the same. Right? There's nothing unique. There's no ownership to a particular user. Right? When a user logs on, they're going to get assigned to desktop. When they log off, we're going to put it back in the pool, but we're also going to clean it up. And what a lot of customers will do is actually they'll choose to refresh on log off, so it's back to that fresh given state, or they'll actually do a delete and log off. So as soon as you log off, end user, well, I'm actually going to delete that desktop you're using and I'm going to create a fresh new one for the next user. <laughs> so benefits, the end users, it's going to be faster log on, we're going to get DR, we're going to get follow me desktop. So everything that VDI promises for the end user. IT, the key benefit here is we're going to take away that complexity of the SAN, right? We're going to contain stuff like boot storms, log on storms. We're going to come up with this building block, block approach. So if I'm putting storage inside an ESX server, I'm going to then say and scale and test, say that ESX server can handle 100 users or 120 users, whatever my number is in my environment. And I know it's going to cope with that. And I know that the storage I put inside that server is going to cope with it. The memory of the CPU is going to do that. If I need more than 100 users, well, I go and put another server. I build up multiple blocks. 
So very, very scalable, very easy. It's also very easy to get started in, right? How do I start my view project? Do I go and buy a big <coughs> SAN with all the stories and all the SSDs in it? Well, no, I buy one server with some local stories and I test that, I scale out from that point. So obviously for businesses, this kind of reduces all the cost across the board. So that sounds great, but we just announced View 5.1 and we've announced some storage stuff in that, haven't we? Does that mean I don't have to worry about this anymore? Well, yes and no. There's the stuff in 5.1 that's going to help, but it's not going to alleviate the problem altogether. So we still really need to think about storage. So what's new in 5.1? <coughs> lots and lots of new features. I'm not going to go through every single one. Key storage feature is something we're calling the View Storage Accelerator. Um, this went through about three or four different names inside VMware. Um, it's also content-based read cache, which kind of gives an idea of what it's actually aimed at. Um, essentially what this is, is each ESX server, each vSphere server is going to have a cache using memory that's going to store commonly accessed blocks of data. So if I've got 100 desktops on that server, the first one boots up and it reads common blocks to do with Windows, we're going to store them in memory. So when the next 99 desktops boot, they don't go back to my disk to read those blocks, they read them from the memory. So that's what it's given me. So very, very good for bursts, for that kind of initial log on storm, boot storm, stuff like that but it's read-only. So it's not going to help me with writes. Right. It's also not really going to help me with my steady state. So up once my desktop's up and running and my user on desktop one is accessing <coughs> particular things that are, that are unique to him, then that caching of that is not really going to help my other 99 users on that server. Right. So it will help, it alleviates the problem, definitely helps with read I.O but it's not going to be the complete answer to taking I.O. at the equation. So how much that helps? Well, it can reduce IOPS and boot storms by up to 80%. So really, really effective there. And where that helps us is, well, how do I size my IOPS for my storage? What we used to do was we looked at stuff like peaks, worst case scenarios. When I do a boot storm, I boot my 100 desktops, my 1,000 desktops my environment, how much IOPS do I need? And the reality is most of them are reads, right? So if we can take all that away, then how I size my storage is more for the steady state for the average, right? So I've reduced the overall IOPS I need to size for. So we'll do it on multi-host as well. We are keeping a cache on each host. So the, the cache is unique to each host, but this is a benefit across multi-hosts as well. Because then if I've got seven hosts in a cluster all running 100 desktops, all the desktops are running Windows 7. So all the blocks are actually very, very similar. Right. So we've got other stuff that helps with storage. We've got array integration. So how we spin up desktops, how we actually clone desktops, how we use Composer to do that. We now integrate with NFS arrays. So we can actually get the array to offload and do the work for us. So create me a thousand desktops instead of Composer, instead of vSphere doing that operation. Let's just tell the SAN to do it, because it's going to be a lot quicker and a lot faster at doing that. So speeding up those operations, like creating desktops, like reprovisioning, like recomposing my pool, is going to be a lot quicker. We've also increased the scale. So how big can I go? Um, one of the limitations we've had really is around about the number of hosts in a cluster. So we still recommend eight hosts in a cluster if you're using BMFS, so we're using um, uh, Fiber or iSCSI formatted with BMFS. We're still seeing eight hosts in a cluster, and that's down to a SCSI re reservation. Um, we're being quite conservative there with the <coughs> recommendation. But what we have said is, you know, NFS doesn't use that kind of SCSI reservation method. Let's up that, right, up to 32. And we've tested that and kind of scaled that to size. So the recommendation now is, well, if you're using NFS as your storage, feel free to go through 32 nodes in your cluster. And that, that increases your flexibility. There's other stuff we've done to increase scale. We've taken the composer component, and we've allowed you the option to install that in a separate server for scalability. So traditionally, you had to install it in virtual center. So let's allow you to put that on a separate server. 
dedicate some resources to that, and then we know Composer is going to be a lot faster at doing those, those tasks. Um, we've offloaded stuff like Syslog as well. So how I track and look at events that are happening, well, let's put that as a separate task, and then it'll scale. This, a lot of this has come out of some of our customers who have actually de deployed in large, large uh, environments. So we have one bank over in uh, Japan who are at 50,000 desktops. So obviously our traditional, well, eight servers in a cluster, Composer needs to be on virtual center, wasn't really working well for that kind of customer. So we needed to kind of push the scaling out a bit. USB, really nothing to do with storage, but just to mention it, um, the USB stack in 5.1 has completely changed. We've rewritten it. Um, essentially what this means is USB stack is unified across all our, all our products. So instead of having a different one for View, vSphere, Fusion, Workstation, they're now one stack. Uh, what it means for View is really a USB um, device is going to work out of the box. You're not really going to have to tweak it. So more and more devices will work just by plugging them in. So the, the one I came across a lot was stuff like the Philips speech mic that's used for dictation. I can see Peter, my colleague, laughing down the front here. Um, so a lot of uh, lawyers and solicitors use this for dictation. And traditionally, it was a bit of a, a fudge to make it work. You had to go in and tweak the USB devices. Now we're finding devices like that, you plug them in, they'll work. Other big feature is um, in USB, if I plug the device in and I claim that device for my view session, we will reclaim that device on next launch of the session. So I plugged a USB device into my end client, like a Philips speech mic. I close my session, I go home, I come back tomorrow. While I launch my session, it will automatically reclaim that device as being, yes, I need to redirect that to your view environment. Two-factor authentication, we used to only do um, RSA key fobs, so now we've extended that, so we're doing radius. And what this means is if you're going to deploy out where you're, you're really concerned about security, you're going to deploy out over an internet connection, you want two-form authentication, it really opens up the field to a lot of other two-form authentication that's going to support radius. Right? So it opens those options up. Um, We've also about to launch, or we just launched two days ago, um, vCenter operations for view. So we've had vCenter operations for server workloads for over a year, year and a half now. This is a view specific version. Right? It is a separate product. We're going to sell it separately. But really what it's going to do is understand some of the objects and constructs that make up a view environment. So if we look at vCenter operations for servers, well, that's fine, it understands what a cluster is, it understands what a resource pool is, and understands what a server is, and stuff like that. But it doesn't understand, in terms of view objects, what a desktop is, what a user is, what a desktop pool is. So all those constructs and objects are now available inside vCenter operations for view. So it's going to allow us to really understand the health of my environment. Do I have performance issues? Is it scaling properly? And when I do have a fault, well, help me dig into that, right? So you could have your help desk sitting at a screen like this, and what they can do is they can stick in a username. So the user phones in, says, my desktop isn't running properly, right? And that's about as usually as much information as you get, you know. It's too slow, applications won't launch, or it's just not working. So we put in that username, because we understand what the user object is. We search for them, we find their objects, we also find their parent objects. So we understand what pool they're in. We understand what cluster that pool is running on. We understand all the network objects around about that. So we, we look at stuff like PCRP metrics. Right? So we understand everything that's important to that end user in terms of delivering their desktop to them. Right? So we can then look at what's happening in those objects. Right? We can identify root cause very easily. Right? We can say, well, in this case, it's CPU. We get a nice graph, right? And anyone who's looked at vCenter operations before knows that we kind of get these nice graphs that show when stuff is abnormal. So vCenter operations is kind of uh, self-learning analytics. So it will learn what is normal behavior, or it will learn what's abnormal. And it will learn at what times those things are abnormal and normal. So when we start to get abnormal behavior, it's abnormal for this time. And that's when vCenter operations starts alerting you. So you don't get all those alerts 
at nine o'clock on a Monday morning when everyone's logging in. Of course, the system's busy at that time. If we see that at two o'clock on a Sunday afternoon, then that's abnormal, right? So then start warning me about that. So this is bringing all this into a view environment and kind of giving us end-to-end -end diagnostics, troubleshooting, and preemptive performance monitoring. So we can start looking at stuff like capacity, right? Do I have enough capacity in here? <coughs> so if I get a request to create another 100 desktops, and I'm gonna fling it into that cluster or create another pool, then how does that affect my environment, right? Am I safe to do that? Do I affect everyone's performance? So that's vCenter operations for view. We've obviously keep on improving. Every release we do, we keep on improving piece of IP. So we're gonna kind of, this one we focus really on a few things in terms of optimizing multimedia playback, video playback. We've reduced the CPU demand um, on those operations. And what that means is, well, I can get more users on my ESX server or my vSphere server. Because if we're using less CPU to actually encode the video stream, then we're actually able to fit more users on. So that's enough about 5.1. Just wanted to touch on that. Then we talked about this stateless desktop using local storage, right? So how do we actually go around about designing this? Well, one thing that's important to understand is we see view design as a cyclical procedure, right? We'll make decisions. We start up at a use case definition. It's not appearing very well on that screen. Um, we start with the use case definition and we go around and we look at pool design. And we go all the way around through all them and we come up with the end user device, what device we're gonna get. We then have to look at all those decisions we've made and say, right, has someone like stories design, and in this case using local disk, how has that affected every other decision I've just made? A local storage obviously has an effect on stuff like pool design, right, the block design, my virtual infrastructure. So it's gonna have an impact there. So you need to look at decisions and then go back around and make sure that you don't have to change anything else. So we're going to focus on storage design here. Um, and if we look at how we do traditional shared storage in view, what we say is, well, we build up a cluster, and that's going to host my virtual desktops. Right? And then what we do is we create a bunch of services around about that, a bunch of VMs that are going to run services, like my view manager, my connection broker. We're going to have a SQL server or an Oracle server to store my databases. And we've obviously got DNS, and we've got virtual center there. Now, best practice says, well, I'll actually put them on a separate cluster. So we'll put them on an infrastructure cluster that's there to host the infrastructure. Now, if you've got vSphere cluster already that you've virtualized all your server workloads in, just use that to host it. But what we do say in best practice, if you're doing 1,000 plus desktops, then best practice is stick it on separate ESX vSphere servers. So then what we do is we put some shared storage in. Right. And that's where we run the desktops. Now, in reality, we use the shared stories to run all the infrastructure VMs as well. Um, now, that's where the challenge comes, because this shared storage, well, it's maybe already there. I have to make it then work for this VDI. Can I get enough IOPS out of it? Is it the right kind of device to be using? And this is traditionally where we have the problem. So what we see is you know, an overload IOPS. Um, either the back end or the front end on that SAN. So, to understand the problem, we really actually lead to look at, well, what makes up a linked clone? So if I say, well, I'm creating a thousand desktops in a pool, right, what does that mean? You know, is it a thousand copies of the same desktop? Not with linked clones, right? But the linked clones made up of lots of different objects. And the objects have different use cases and they often have very different IO demands. So it's important to understand what makes up that. So if we look at, well, I'm gonna create a thousand desktops from this master, what actually happens is we create a replica, a replica of that master based on the snapshot of that master. So we create a replica in every single data store that you tell us you're gonna deploy this pool to. Right? Or you've got the option of well, only create one replica, but put it over on that SSD or something that's really, really fast at being read. Then for each link clone, we create an OS drive. This is really a difference file, right? Very, very small. It's just gonna contain 
any of the writes we allow users to make to their individual link clone desktop, any of the reads to the C drive are going to be redirected up to the replica. So you can suddenly see, right, if we create a thousand desktops and they've all got their own individual OS drives that are very, very small difference files, and they all redirect their, their reads up to the replica, that read has to be, that replica has to be on very, very fast read technology. Right? So two models. Shove it off onto single, very, very fast SSD, something like that, or we create one per data store, as I said. Right? And the reason we create one per data store in that model is we're containing the amount of link clones that are going to read to a particular replica. So we, we recommend no more than 128 in one data store. So no more than 128 link clones are going to read back to a single replica. But there are other files that come in to link clone that we need to consider for I.O. Uh, and also for space when we're looking at this. So you look at the um, Windows page file, we offer the option to redirect this off into a separate virtual disk per link clone. So this is Windows swap files, temp files. Let's put it on a disposable disk and separate that out. And that then allows us to separate the I.O. The other thing that's going to do for us is it's going to optimize the Windows swap file as far as we can because it's going to delete and create that swap that disposable disk on VM power on. So if I do stuff like um, power on a VM, it's going to create that disk and my swap file is going to be perfectly unfragmented. Right? So yes, over a period of time, it's going to get defragmented, but if we then do delete or power off on user log off, well, we delete that swap file and we recreate it on log off. So my swap file should, should be fairly unfragmented. Right? So we can separate that out. Um, we have also a VM swap file. So VM swap file, just like virtualizing servers, uh, is used in case we don't have enough memory in the server. So if we're running short of memory, one of the methods, mechanisms we use to, to um, work around that memory shortage is we have a swap file for each individual VM. Now normally it's equal to the amount of memory that we allocate to the VM. If you size your memory correctly, this should be rarely used, right? And in the stateless local storage model, we can actually get it down to a point where we'll never use it. But unfortunately, we still need to create it, so we still need to actually put it somewhere. There are other files as well then. We've got a log file. Uh, it's small, about 100 meg, but something we need to account in when we're looking at disk space consumption. Um, and we have also have something called the CBRC digest file. So this is if we're using the view storage accelerator that's part of 5.1, then we're going to consume a bit of disk space. Right? So for each link clone, what we do is we create a file that understands all the blocks in that, that link clone. That's called a digest file. So inside that link clone, we do that. Now it's more important from a space consumption rather than an I.O. issue. So, Sorry, have a not in a floating desktop. So if we do a persistent, you're right, there's absolutely a, a, a user, I'm trying to remember what the name is. Uh, there's a persistent disk there that contains the user profile and we'll redirect the user profile out. But that's only in a persistent desktop pool, right? Um, so I've talked about this a little bit, but some of the things we need to look at when we're doing uh, storage um, it's, we have to size for peak. Now, if we can reduce the peak down to stuff like view storage accelerator, reduce the impact of logging boot, boot storms, then we bring that peak down. But we still need to design for worst case scenario, right? Um, steady state is important, but it's not going to be what's the limiting factor. Um, in your environment, if you can say, hand on heart, well, I'm going to do all my recomposes, all my power and operations on a Sunday or out of hours, so I'm not going to affect any users and nobody's going to be sitting waiting on that, then great. But the reality is that most of the customers that you'll find you have to do recomposes, you'll find you have to do power on operations at times when it isn't optimal. So if we can reduce that down and speed that up, then it's all going to help. Right? Very important to understand your read-write ratio, because if your read-write ratio is, you know, 90% read, then view storage accelerator is going to be great for you. It's going to solve a lot of your problems. 
But if you're steady state, and this is what we find in a lot of environments, is, is more the other way, so 80, 90 percent writes, then that's not going to help me when I'm up and running. So how do I solve that? And this is where this is where uh, stuff like tiered storage comes in. So when we look at tiered storage, there's lots of options here. Um, we can tier stuff inside view. We looked at all those objects that make up link, link clone. We can put a lot of those different components on different data stores. So those data stores, some of them could be served by SSD, some could be stored by SAS or SATA. You know, so we can tier stuff that way. Um, but we can also use SAN tiering as well. Right. If I can get to this. So we can look at um, SAN technology as well. We're looking at SSD. Uh, we can look at SANs that do automatic tiering. So if you were to say, well, money's no object to me, and you know what, I'm a greenfield site, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to go out and order a SAN to do it, then you know, look at something that's going to do tiering, right? self-tiering inside that. So these technologies will look at the blocks that are hot, that are accessed often. They'll move them up a level so they're getting best service. They're held in faster um, tiering. And they'll look at the blocks that are least frequently used, and they'll move them down the way automatically. So then, you know, in those mechanisms, we don't really need to worry about, um, I put my <coughs> replica here because that's going to be fastest. I put this pool here and I put my, my swap files over here because they're going to get the best write performance. Right? Let the SAN worry about it. So if you can afford that technology, brilliant. Right? Um, but we also have the option to put, as I've said, SSDs inside local ESX servers. SSDs come in a couple of different flavors, so just a kind of warning, uh, look at what type of SSDs you're looking at, um, the single layer and multi-layer. Uh, multi-layer usually means we're using the same um, part of the chip for uh, multiple um, bits of data. Uh, they're just more prone to faster wear out uh, and data corruption. So you want to look at the lifetime of your SSDs when you're, you're purchasing them. So. How does that translate? How do we use local storage, all those objects? Well, we still build up a separate cluster for our infrastructure, and we have a separate cluster for our VDI. And we're still going to have shared storage, because um, we're going to have to host all these uh, infrastructure objects somewhere. So we, we want HA, we want um, DRS and vMotion for our virtual center and our view managers uh, there. We're also going to use the, the shared storage to host our masters. Right. So our master VM, where are we going to put that? Well, we don't want that in an individual server. Let's store that on shared storage. Now, the connection down to my VDI cluster can be NFS, it can be iSCSI, it can be fiber. Your choice is yours. Right. But then how do we actually store the link clones? So we put some SSDs into each server. And then in each server, we're going to store a replica for the pool. We're going to store the OS disks, the page files, the log files. Right? So in this model, I've got four servers. Each of them is hosting 100, say. Well, I'm going to have, on this SSD, I'm going to have 100 OS disks and 100 copies of that, one replica, right? and repeat that for each server. The one thing that's missing from that is the swap files. Right? I, I said if we size memory correctly, the swap files shouldn't be used, the VM swap file. So very, very expensive putting that on SSDs, kind of waste of space, we waste of very valuable space. So what most people will do is they'll put a, a few SAS in each server, um, nice, low, cheap storage, and I'll tell ESX to put all my VM swap files over on that. Right. We should hopefully never use it unless we have a memory issue or memory constraint. So it's not performance, it really isn't a concern. So how we then look at sizing? Um, we need to look at all those objects. Um, don't worry about it too much. I think you get a copy of the slides. Um, we look at all the objects and we look at uh, how we add it up. So we look at the um, number of clones we're going to put in there, size of our master replica. Um, the replica is as big as the amount of data in my master. So even if I created my master as being 40 gig C drive, if I've only got 24 gig of data in there, that's how big the replica is going to be. We need to estimate stuff like uh, the link clone growth. How big is my C drive going to grow before I do something like a refresh or delete on log off? Um, 
OS page file is probably the bigger consumer of disk space, right? Because it's going to be equal to the amount of memory I allocate. Um, VM swap file shouldn't be a consideration on my SSDs, but I do need to count it when I'm working out how many SAS drives I need to put in each server. So we do the math there, and we come up with 125 VMs, comes out at about 537. We need a space for a replica. We need a bit of free space as well, because we never want to fill a volume completely. So we, we best practice says allow 10% overhead. Right? You can use that 10%, but if you ever fill it, then that's when you're going to have problems. Right? So when we're sizing stuff, we try and work in that 10%. So it works out for 120, 125 desktops, while well, I need 617 gig. Right. So where those numbers came from is this customer example. So this customer I'm working with in Dublin, uh, Hertz, everyone knows who Hertz are, obviously car rental company. What they're in the middle of doing is they're virtualizing every single desktop they have over Europe. And they're doing it in a mechanism that uh, whatever they introduce here, they're going to try and then reproduce in Asia Pack, uh, and then probably in the US as well. So what they've done over the last year and a half is virtualized every single desktop in their call center in Dublin. So there's about 1,000 users there. So it's been running for about a year and a half on that. Um, and then they ran into issues. So they, uh, they got to about 800 users, uh, and they had an issue. So st Sorry, I missed how much time was that, sorry? Five. Great, so I'm going to have to speed up. <laughs> Um, so they ran into an issue. So stuff wasn't performant. Uh, and of course, it was IOPS, right? They hadn't considered this. Their SAN vendor hadn't considered this. They hadn't really considered uh, how they should measure that and look at that. So there was lots of contributing factors we dug into. You know, antivirus was not optimal. We, we tuned that down. 60% of the IOPS was down to the antivirus product. So we tuned that down. We tuned their paging file. We took away stuff like this defrag that was meaningless in a VDI environment. Um, they were using spindle-only storage. So they were looking at in terms of, well, if 800 users fits on this many disks to do 4,000, I need this much, which obviously was getting very expensive. So looking at about 2 million for a, a SAN to do that. So we came in and we kind of looked at all the options. Uh, we looked at stuff like accelerated storage, some of the caching technology that was out about the time. We looked at options in terms of tiering, tiering sands and stuff like that. We ended up focusing on local storage. They opted to go for Fusion I.O. Uh, and then a number of SAS drives inside each server. Um, so what they ended up with was building block approach. Right? And each building block handles up to 1,500 users. So inside each building block, there's seven hosts. Uh, each host can handle up to 250 users. Right? So if you remember the math from my space sizing, 125 users needed about 617 gig. Well, each server's hosting double that. So I actually need two Fusion IOs in each server. So I need two 640 gig Fusion IOs. Right? So we're handling the space. Fusion IOs has about 130,000 IOPS. IOPS just, the problem just went away. So for them, it was a very, very, easy way to adopt. And it gave them this kind of building block approach of, you know what, if we grow and we need to add another 500 users, well, I just buy another three or four servers. Right? And how I then repeat it into different regions is very, very easy and repeatable. So this is the makeup of what they ended up building up and very, very scalable. So. That's great, we've got these desktops that are stateless, you know, from a user's perspective, but we need to feed in stuff that's important. And I'm very conscious I'm running out of time. So, we feed the profile in on demand. So in view, you've got persona management. So we can feed that in demand. I log in as an end user, where's my personalization? Where's the stuff that's important to me? Well, persona management, but use that in a combination with folder redirection, right? <coughs> Is there any point in redirecting all the user's files inside their profile and copying them down to their desktop if that virtual desktop is sitting right next to the file share? Right? No, use folder redirection. So use both of them together. Right? There are lots of different options in terms of persona management. We fit in a couple areas. 
So left to right, simple use case, more complex. Right? Understand what the requirements are. Understand how complex you need to be. In some environments, you know, caring about some of the more complex stuff just isn't important. If you look at the business requirement um, of saving somebody's wallpaper, don't care, right? In that environment, maybe folder redirection is all I need. But we can go all the way up to look at stuff like user installed apps and stuff like that. So obviously, um, we just announced we've purchased one over. So that op opens up a couple options as well. You know, so right now you can layer one over on top of you and do local storage with effectively persistent desktops because they're going to abstract the bit that's persistent and then feed it on demand into the desktop. So it opens up a couple of options in this architecture. That, to be honest, we're just trying to get our heads around it right now. So applications, what Hertz did very successfully was they thin apped everything. Um, they virtualized 300 applications in the first month very, very easily. They put a girl on it, they never seen the technology before, brand new to virtualization, never seen thin app. She virtualized 300 apps in a month. Right? And what they've really achieved there is single image management. So they stream all the apps from a file share into the desktop on demand based on your group membership. And you get all the shortcuts and all the applications that you're entitled to. Right? Um, they did find though, and I would recommend that some bigger applications, you'd be better installing in the base image and the master image. So stuff like Office, you can thin app that and there's a great method out there for doing that. But in practice, what you'll find is, well, if 100% of my users use that application, right, and it doesn't change that often, right, how often do you download patches for Office? Right? It's not as frequent as something like Adobe Reader. Right? So I'm not patching very often. So I'll put it in the base image, I'll get a better performant application. And if I do need to patch it, Service Pack comes out for Office, well, I'll recompose. So a combination of the two is, is really what most people will do. All your unique stuff, all the stuff that's kind of used by smaller use groups, thin app it, stream it to them on group membership. So operationally, then no shared storage. How do we cope with stuff like server failure? There's some considerations there. So no HA, no vMotion, no DRS. How do we cope with that? Well, HA, um, an end user is connected to their desktop. That server fails. The connection drops, obviously, because the desktop that was running on it is gone. So what happens is they come back, they re-authenticate to the connection servers. Right? There's going to be some spare desktops in our pool. They'll talk to the connection server. They'll get brokered through to a spare desktop. We'll feed their profile in. We'll feed their applications in. They're up and running. To them, really no difference from what they'd have to do. Right? They need to go back and log back in. Right? How do we ensure then there's enough spare desktops here? And this is where we need to do a bit of careful pool planning. So if I've got a requirement for 600 desktops and I'm going to spread them across seven hosts in my cluster, well, actually what I'll do is I'll create 700 desktops. So I have the amount that are going to run on one individual server, I have the amount extra spare in my pool. Now you can do stuff like look at power policy. So the desktops are powered off. So that extra 100 are powered off. They're not consuming resources. Um, I'd also look at stuff like the concurrency of provisioning and recomposing operations. Um, by default, we're very conservative with Composer. We put it at eight operations concurrently. If you're using stuff like SSD out onto individual servers, and you've got Composer on a very, very performant VM, then you can up that all the way to 50. Now, what we say is taking steps, but it's going to mean these provisioning tasks, these power on tasks are just going to happen so much faster because they're ha all happening in parallel. So plan downtime. I think I'm almost out of time. Plan downtime. Different, slight, slightly different operation because, again, uh, we can't just take the host into maintenance mode and expect all the machines to be, uh, be motion over. So we need to edit the pool, remove the stories that belong to the server we're going to put into host maintenance. Um, we're going to change the pool to, say, delete on log off if we don't have that as the default setting. So when a user logs off, we're going to delete that desktop from that server. So the pool then has removed it. Then we're going to resize the desktop because we don't want to leave it at 700 
because then Composer and Vue are going to go and create the extra 100 on the remaining six servers. We'd overload those six servers. Right. So we can remove that down. Now, the other thing is that could all be scripted. Instead of going into GUI and having to do it for all my individual pools, I could have a series of scripts where I just click, and it's done. Adding the server back in after maintenance is just a reverse of the process. So, key takeaways. Basically, don't be scared of storage. There are lots of options, whether it be local, shared, tiered, accelerated. Have a look at all the options. Try and take this building block approach so you can scale up you don't have to start big to start off. Look at profile management, how you're going to stream that in, whether it be persistent or non-persistent floating desktops. Pro profile management is still of use. So even if you're using persistent desktops, folder redirection may help me. Um, virtualize your apps. Bring that image down to a small number of images to manage. And think about operationally anything that's going to change. So 